Uh, good morning, everyone. I'm Julie Jacobson, uh, past president of ASTMH, and I am thrilled to have you all here for a very, very special session about some very special people, um, President Carter and Rosalind Carter, celebrating 77 years of mar marriage and partnership. And through that time, they've been, yeah. And through that time, they've been great partners to each other for global health and with ASTMH. And with that, we all have a great panel for you today, and I'm going to introduce uh, Kashev Ijev. Ijevs. Ijevs, even practiced beforehand. Uh, <laughs> the head of uh, global health programs at the Carter Center. Thank you very much, uh, Julie, and welcome everyone. I'm Kashev Ijevs, I'm the Vice President for Health at the Carter Center. Um, it's really a pleasure and honor to be actually co-chairing this and co-moderating this uh, with Julie today. And, and by the way, I mean, what Julie has been pretty humble. Uh, she's herself a, you know, a really um, persistent and, um, you know, I would say a feisty public health practitioner <laughs> who actually does take care of the folks at the end of the road herself as well. Um, I, I really want to thank uh, ASTMH for holding this session today to honor uh, President and Mrs. Carter. Uh, as they have been, um, you know, uh, waging peace, fighting disease, and building hope. Um, at this session itself, you know, um, like um, at this particular conference, we have actually had more than 20 presentations, as well as symposia, which have been, um, you know, done by the Carter Center staff in collaboration with our partners and donors. Um, all the work that we do, um, you know, it, it, it's impossible to do without our um, technical partners and donors. Uh, over the years, we have actually published about more than 100 peer-reviewed public publications in the American Journal of Top Med and Hygiene. And, uh, you know, speaking of our uh, partnership with our donor partners and our accomplishments, I just want to sort of highlight a few of them. Um, last year, we reported the lowest ever number of guinea worm cases, or, you know, human cases in the world, which is only 13 human cases on a planet of 8 billion people. So um, that's a remarkable achievement. Um, and for those of you who might not know, on your chairs you actually have these small straw-like filters. These are, these are the pipe filters. One of the tools um, to basically drink water um, through this filter so that you don't get infected with the guinea worm. Uh, in addition to that, you know, a Carter Center was able to, earlier this year, stop mass drug administration with ivermectin for river blindness for 19 million people in Nigeria who will no longer need um, ivermectin. And this is, again, a remarkable achievement because this is the, this is the highest number of stop mass drug administration for river blindness ever recorded in the world. So, and then, and then a couple of other really quick ones. One is like, when you talk about Mali, a country which actually has challenges from insecurity standpoint, and we have been working in Mali for more than three decades on trachoma. And in April of this year, um, Mali was declared as uh, a country which has eliminated trachoma as a public health problem and was actually verified by the World Health Organization. So that is actually, again, <clears throat> a remarkable achievement. <clears throat> Since we are actually uh, not only honoring President Carter, but also Mrs. Carter, and Mrs. Carter's uh, work on mental health, you know, goes back to her time when she was the first lady in Georgia. And, and obviously she was way ahead of uh, all of us in terms of the importance of mental illness and the stigma reduction around mental illness. I mean, we now talk a lot about mental health because of the COVID-19, but Mrs. Carter was ahead of us. And she had started to recognize the importance of mental health and reduction of stigma. And earlier last year, Georgia was able to pass you know, after a long time in the, wor in the working, um, the, their first Mental Health Parity Act, which actually enables now people to get treated for mental illness and the same footing like if you were to go to a doctor's office with a broken leg, I mean, you can still, your insurance should be able to cover it. So that's another remarkable achievement Huge. when you talk about mental health. So, <laughs> thank you very much. <clears throat> So President Carter turned 99, as you know, and Mrs. Carter turned 96 
in August. Uh, both of them are still, um, you know, surrounded by love and affection. They're comfortable at home. Uh, President Carter still asks about guinea worm, and uh, he still emphasizes that, you know, uh, he doesn't have a lot of time, so he wants to, to make sure that the guinea worm is gone before he goes. But uh, the important thing is that, you know, even this year, we've only recorded six human cases, only six human cases of, uh, of guinea worm, which is already a reduction of 50% from last year. So we're definitely in the right trajectory to eradicate guinea worm. Um, and then, you know, I, um, it's my distinct honor uh, to also, um, you know, the moderator of today's session, the Emmy Award winning um, Kane Fairbaugh, uh, you know, he's actually been a long standing friend of the Carter Center and has covered Mr. Uh, President Carter as well. So you will actually hear <clears throat> from, the, from him moderating the panel today with a very exciting discussion as well. But before that, <clears throat> let me just move on and, uh, you know, introduce a giant in public health, you know, um, Dr. Bill Fagey who needs no introduction because he was the very first um, executive director for the Carter Center, and he actually was also the former director for U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. So let's hear from um, Dr. Fagey. Almost a half century before we had the WHO, the World Health Organization, we already had the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene promoting the idea that every place in the world is both local and global simultaneously. And in the 120 years since the society was organized, there's been such a dramatic change as we see infant mortality rates go down, under five mortality rates go down, life expectancy go up all over the world. And one can summarize 120 years in four words incredible developments and incredible disparities. In the midst of all this, there are two things that have happened in the last few decades that have caught my attention. One is, at the beginning of the century, the Gates Foundation brought new life into global health with resources. But the other thing is what happened with global health and politics. We sometimes get infuriated with politicians, and there are people who do not want us to associate with politicians. We have no choice. It's the politicians who approve our appropriations. We're in a single-payer system for most of us, and so we have to figure out how to get politicians invested in health outcomes and not just health appropriations. And the poster child for this is President Jimmy Carter. He became interested in this when he was asking me whether I might want to be the executive director of the Carter Center. And I told him my reservations were, since a teenager, I've been interested in global health. And he said, would it make a difference if I also became interested in global health? And he did, and what a difference it made. Because you and I could go to another country and perhaps have a meeting with the Minister of Health, maybe if we're lucky, the Minister of Finance, but we could not see the head of state. President Carter would go directly to the head of state. And he convinced, for instance, President Babangida in Nigeria to become involved in guinea worm. And Babangida put up a million dollars of Nigerian money for that. President Carter got Sudan to have a ceasefire so that we could work on guinea worm, onchocerciasis, polio. He was able to work on metazan and go country by country, even with the CEO of Merck, Roy Vagelos. Merck has given over 1 billion free treatments of metazan, and it's changed the entire trajectory of onchocerciasis. President Carter got involved then in trachoma. He was the one that convinced the SmithKline Beecham to give albendazole so that the world could start a lymphatic filariasis program. He was involved in helminth programs and sanitation. He was involved in getting Norman Borlaug, the Nobel laureate from 1970 for the Green Revolution in India and Pakistan, involved with Sasakawa in Africa to improve agricultural output. He was the one that introduced the, the quality protein maize 
to Africa. Maize has two deficiencies, lysine and tryptophan. And in Ghana, he was able to introduce a quality product that had those two amino acids, so it was a complete food. Borlaug said five years after the introduction, 60% of the maize in Ghana was now quality protein maize. Mrs. Carter, of course, has been involved in every part of these programs, and in addition, she's introduced mental health programs to Africa, particularly to places like Liberia, post-Civil War and post Ebola outbreaks. So I stand in awe of what the Carters have done for global health, and I thank them for that. And I thank everybody in the society for having joined in for a common objective, global health equity. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is uh, Kane Fairbaugh and uh, I'm the Midwest correspondent for Voice of America and uh, 22 years ago I would say, um, I didn't know what guinea worm was, I didn't know what river blindness was, I did not know what lymphatic filariasis was and uh, I had an assignment in which I had to interview President Carter during a book tour. And so I, uh, I had to do some reading up and I had to become well accustomed to what President Carter was working on and what he was doing. and. I think since that time, which was 2005, um, I have now interviewed President Carter, I think, over 20 times. Um, I think I've been involved in four or five different panel discussions with Dr. Hopkins and Dr. Richards, and um, I think I've produced over 150 stories on all of the aspects of the Carter Center and all of the work they've done and, and all of the TV stories. And so I'm not a doctor and I'm not a medical professional, but um, I, I, I feel like I've vicariously lived through all of you who are doing the work in the field through the reporting that I've done uh, to the world through Voice of America's uh, 47 different language services. And uh, it's an honor just for me to be up here sharing the stage with these people that are doing this important work throughout the world. Let me introduce who we're, who we're, with, uh, who we're here with uh, this morning. Dr. Donald Hopkins is the Carter Center Special <coughs> Advisor for Guinea Worm Eradication. He's to my left. Um, Dr. Sarah Carter is the eldest granddaughter of President and Mrs. Carter, and she is a principal with Science Policy Consulting, LLC. Dr. Frank Richards is the Carter Center Special Advisor for Guinea Worm Eradication. Dr. Julie, Julie Jacobson is the Bridges to Development Managing Partner and ASTMH Presidential Advisor, and she's to my right. And Dr. Kashif Ijaz is the Carter Center Vice President for Health Programs. Thank you for your kind introduction. Thank you this morning. Um, Sarah, I think we just want to really begin with you, and I just want you to maybe just tell us how your grandparents are doing. Yeah, uh, they are hanging in there. I, I last saw them on uh, my grandfather's birthday, which was just a few weeks ago on October 1st. Um, he just turned 99, uh, and they're doing all right. You know, uh, it's been in the news a lot. He went into hospice care in February, um, and my grandmother also uh, has been suffering from dementia, but they they were very happy when we were all there. I think there were 25 of us or, or more uh, that went down there on, their, on his birthday. And so um, they're surrounded by love. I, you know, a, a big thing for my grandmother is in supporting caregivers. And she's pointed out that, you know, almost, you know, that everybody in the world will either be a caregiver or receive care uh, at some point in their lives. And they're definitely on that receiving end and they are surrounded by caregivers, but family, medical caregivers, uh, you know, their whole community, their church, the whole, uh, the whole town of Plains, Georgia, and they are, they're doing well. Sarah and I had an opportunity to talk before we had the conversation today, and we were discussing how, how they are living the end of their lives as much how they live the rest of it, and it's also a teachable moment for the rest of us, isn't it? Yeah, well, it's, um, yeah, it's true, I, especially, you know, my grandpa goes into hospice care, and that really raised... That was back in February, and I, I think it has changed the perceptions about what hospice care is. You know, it, it's not that he was going to die imminently. You know, it's that it's a, just a new phase of the kind of medical care. Um, and similarly with my grandmother, I, you know, she, she we went very public with that she has dementia. You know, that's not something that should be hidden. That's not something to be ashamed of. She is very, you know, she wants to make sure she, you know, has lived her whole life trying to reduce that kind of stigma. And so just talking about it and making, putting it out there is something that has been 
important to them their whole lives. Julie, I want to kind of talk to you here a little bit about um, honoring the, the president, M President and Mrs. Carter's life and legacy. Um, we're, we're, we're obviously here at AS MTH. Um, I think everybody up here probably has a personal story or a connection to the Carters, but what's your connection? Wow. Well, um, I've been really privileged to ha have interactions with President Carter more than one time in several different locations. I, I was at the Gates Foundation and was responsible for um, the, uh, fun funding several of the Carter um, programs, and uh, including guinea worm and river blindness. Frank, I won't forget to say river blindness. Um, and but one of my best memories is uh, President Carter came to um, the Gates Foundation. Uh, and I got to interview President Carter and Bill Gates <clears throat> Sr. And if you don't know, Bill Gates Sr. is also an, an amazing man who you know, really inspired the start of the Gates Foundation. And I was sitting with them in the, the ready room, you know, and President Carter's sitting there with Bill Sr. over here, and he's like, <clears throat> so Bill, how old are you anyway? <laughs> and he's like, uh, well, I just turned uh, 90, and he's like, I'm still your senior by five months, you gotta respect me. And I'm like, really? That's why he has to respect you? Um, they were just so cute together and, 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 and so inspiring, sharing stories of traveling to Nigeria together and just watching them together, like uh, President Carter teasing uh, Bill Sr. because they both were given babies up on a stage, you know, and the, the people, and, and, and Bill's baby would not stop crying, and President Carter was giving him some tips. <laughs> uh, so that was a really special memory, and his, um, his candidness about talking openly about politics, diplomacy, the need to step up, and it's such an important time for the society right now and for the world as we look at all the things that are happening. How do we use our voices for good, for positive change? And he's been an icon for that, and I think that's the perfect thing of bringing this group here and honoring him, and I hope that the live stream, he gets to see it because that would bring me great joy and, uh, and yeah. Um, President Carter has indicated that his Life, one of his life goals is to see the eradication of guinea worm in his lifetime, and one of the people who has been efforting that, that directive <laughs> from President Carter is Dr. Donald Hopkins. Um, Dr. Hopkins, can you kind of talk to us about maybe taking this fight to President Carter and, and sort of pitching him the idea that this can be done and it can be done within our lifetime? Yeah. Well, it's important to know that during the first year of the Carter administration in the spring of 1977, he charged one of his White House aides, Dr. Peter Bourne, who was in charge of drug abuse in controlling drug abuse from the, uh, the White House. And uh, he charged uh, Peter Bourne to do an inventory of all the international health programs the US government was responsible for at that time and to propose other things that might, the US government might do to help other countries with international, with various uh, diseases. Now, 1977 was the same year when we had the last case of smallpox, so eradication was in the air. Uh, Peter Bourne asked Bill Feige, who was director of uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, if he could help in uh, this process. Bill Feige asked me if I would uh, commute to Washington and, and help with that, and I did. And in the, in the process of that, I taught Peter Bourne about guinea worm disease, among other things that we were doing. We did the little survey. Not much happened because, of course, President Carter and the administration had a lot of other things to do. But then after the White House in 1986, when the Carter Center put together its first international consultation on uh, various tropical uh, diseases in, in, in Atlanta, Peter Bourne and I were asked to give presentations at that uh, meeting. I talked generally about health, population, nutrition in, uh, in uh, less wealthy countries. And Peter Bourne uh, spoke uh, especially about guinea worm, among other diseases. He had asked, Bourne had asked in advance to borrow some of my slides about uh, guinea worm disease, and he showed those during his talk at lunch. And that is when President Carter remembers hearing about uh, guinea worm disease. Bourne continued to lobby, and Bill Feige continued to lobby President Carter afterwards. In 1986, later that year, November, President Carter was in Pakistan, asked the uh, head of state of Pakistan uh, about guinea worm disease. The head of state didn't know about guinea worm. His minister of health did know, came from a guinea worm area. As a result of that interaction, the Carter Center 
and uh, government of Pakistan agreed to work together uh, to uh, start eradicating uh, guinea worm disease, eliminating guinea worm disease in Pakistan. And uh, the uh, Carter Center then began engaging with, with other countries since then, but that was the start of it. I have never seen guinea worm in person myself, except contained in a vial, which Dr. Richards, I think, and Dr. Hopkins uh, showed me during um, the Countdown to Zero exhibit at the Carter Center back in 2017. I think I've only seen a real guinea worm, well, what was a real guinea worm contained in a vial, um, in, in, a, in a preservative. How many in the audience have actually seen a guinea worm in person? Um, of course, there are a few here, and obviously those of us here on the stage. Um, now, the reality is there's only six human cases uh, to today, 13 cases last year. So <laughs> the reality that we could actually see one in person is so remote now at this point. Um, hopefully nobody in an audience in the future will ever be raising their hands to say that they've seen a guinea worm in person. And um, it is because of the work of President Carter, Mrs. Carter, and all of the people that work in the Carter Center's uh, health programs. And so um, I'm sure you saw some of the slides here and some of the pictures, and certainly in some of these videos, when you see this, President Carter isn't somebody who's sitting at behind a podium uh, talking from the Carter Center about doing this work. He is actually in the field, standing right behind a guinea worm victim in which the worm is extracting from their leg, and he is there as they're treating this, and he sees it emerging, and he sees the treatment in person. He's also seen in videos handing out individual doses of mectazan, uh, or ivermectin, um, uh, to people in these areas, and I think that for those of us who know uh, his stature and who he is, it's remarkable to see a former president in person, in country, doing this. And Frank, you're, you're there with him. Maybe talk to me, talk to us all a little bit about, you know, getting him involved and how important it is to maybe help further the work. Sure, and thanks everybody for, for coming, and uh, thanks Sarah for um, your, your presence here and, and reflections about the transparency of the Carters. Um, I think we all know their authenticity and, and what they're really dedicated to, uh, which is peace, um, human rights, alleviation of suffering, freedom and democracy. So with that said, to answer your question, I, I, uh, I would like to quickly relate a, a, an interesting story from 2013. And, and that was a time when Colombia, the country of Colombia, was to be the first country in the world to be certified as free of river blindness transmission. And they were gonna have a big celebration and President Carter wanted to go and attend. Unfortunately, we had the news from the president's office of, uh, of, of President Santos that he would not be able to attend, but he, he would see President Carter for a breakfast meeting before the ceremony. So uh, I was part of the delegation that went along with people from our onchocerciasis elimination program for the Americas. Mrs. Carter was there. President Carter had his breakfast meeting with uh, President Santos and suddenly we we're getting this news that President Santos has changed his mind. He's coming to the, uh, to the ceremony and we were of course excited, but how did President Carter pull this off? How did that happen? And so President Carter is relating what happened, because I, I wasn't there. And he said, well, I told him this is a big deal. It was big enough for me to come see this ceremony. And it was, it was a victory for his country. It would be widely recognized that he, that he ought to be there. And President Santos replied, well, but I have a schedule. I have a schedule this morning. And President Carter says, I used to be president of a country. <laughs> <laughs> And if there was a place or a meeting I needed to go to, I would tell my chief of staff, give my regrets and go to where we needed to go. And so here's President Carter pointing out <laughs> that you ought to be there and pointing out, um, you know, I would be there, if, why not you? So what we had is, was an opportunity while President Santos was there in the audience to see a beautiful um, documentary talking about river blindness, but also talking about how river blindness and Columbia was really a remnant of the Atlantic slave trade. And that the black Colombian population was the one that suffered. Genera can you imagine since 300 years, parasite generation, human generation after human generation. And 
President Santos, who you may know won the Nobel Peace Prize as well for his commitment to uh, peace, democracy, was also very, very concerned and committed to the Afro-Colombiano community, community. And when the invites came on, he saw all of the delegation from those communities, the African faces from Colombia, smiling and looking at him for their accomplishment. And I heard like the most wonderful, spontaneous speech from President Santos thanking them and tears <laughs> streaming down his face as he shook everyone's hand and told them how they had helped the country and that he would continue to help them with further health care. And then he thanked President Carter and said, President Carter, you were right. I needed to be here. And President Carter said, thank you for coming. Now, will you help me with the other five presidents of Latin America? <laughs> <laughs> and he said, I will, and he did. You know, Dr. Jaws, I know that you've come on board the Carter Center since the Carters have sort of uh, uh, Pulled, pulled back from being as active and engaged in the field. But they obviously set the stage for everybody in your organization to continue to be able to do the work as prominently as they, as they do it. Maybe explain how um, all of the doors that are opened are making possible what you're doing right now today. Yeah, uh, it, it is actually a, a tough act to follow because um, you know, of the high standards that have been established. Uh, but you know, we are definitely very committed in uh, eradicating guinea worm, and we will do it because, as you, as the numbers are showing, both on the human numbers as well as on the animal side, and uh, as Don Hopkins always tells me that we are actually going to get to zero on the human side before we get to the animals, but we are definitely going very committed to doing it. Similarly, you know, elimination of um, uh, river blindness transmission as well as um, you know elimination of trachoma as a public health problem and lymphatic filariasis. These are the areas which we'll continue to do. But at the same point in time, I mean, mental health is on everybody's minds, and this is really important, uh, more so than ever, uh, for us to be, be focusing on, whether it's, whether it's public policy, whether it's actually training the journalists to be able to um, you know, report accurately and reduce stigma around mental illness. Uh, but in addition to that, we are also, um, you know, as, as spin-offs, because Carter Center is really fortunate to have both peace programs as, health, as well as health programs under the same roof. And um, to be able to take advantage of the peace and health collaborations uh, when it comes to um, you know, accessing certain communities which are inaccessible, um, like we did in Mali recently, um, and be able to get the Guinea workers into those communities, um, building up on something that President Carter actually had started um, during the Sudan uh, Guinea Worm ceasefire, as a result of which now today Sudan is at the brink of uh, uh, eradicating um, and getting certified for eradication of guinea worm. And at the same point, I have the other two quick things are health system strengthening, which is really important to strengthen the public health systems in various countries where the Carter Center currently works with our vertical programs. And lastly, which is on everyone's mind today as well, is climate change and its impact on, on uh, vector-borne diseases and the parasitic diseases that we all work on, and to see how we can actually build resilience and mitigate the effects of climate change in the distribution of disease, and basically even predict, uh, try and predict uh, what do we need to do in the future years as we plan our um, existing work and existing commitments in order to be prepared for that. Dr. Hopkins, um, Dr. Jaws uh, brought up a very important story that we should probably relay here because um, there was, uh, and this is a very prominent way, and I think which the health programs of the Carter Center um, overlap with the peace and democracy programs of the Carter Center, and that is the Guinea Worm ceasefire. Um, maybe talk to us about that story and, and how unprecedented that was. So this was March 1995, and at that time, up to that time, the, uh, we had been working, Carter Center was involved in several of the countries, especially in West Africa, and we had basically had the strategy of, we've got plenty to do in West Africa, Let's uh, leave uh, Sudan aside for the time being. They're fighting. And, but in uh, December 1994, we decided, well, now let's try to start uh, getting things going in, in Sudan. So this was a trip in which uh, President Minister Carter had been in Nigeria, met with the head of, head of state there. We had this wonderful situation where the head of state's wife, invited by Mrs. Carter, agreed to come down to this village in Nigeria 53 
car motorcade rolling in this, <laughs> into this uh, small village. Get over to East Africa at uh, Nairobi. The uh, President Carter invites uh, Gary Stryker, who was the CNN uh, bureau chief there, to come with us to Khartoum. Uh, but in the meantime, President Carter has spoken to the uh, so-called rebel leader, uh, Dr. John Garang, on, on the South Sudan side in Nairobi, and asked him if he would agree to a, seedside, a ceasefire if the uh, government of Sudan would agree to the ceasefire. And uh, as President Carter has said, thinking perhaps that the northern side would not agree, Garang did agree. And so when uh, President Carter arrived in Khartoum, he had invited Gary Stryker to come with us from Nigeria, from, from uh, Nairobi. And in President Carter's discussion with the head of state of Pakistan, he uh, said, you know, the, the, the Dr. Garang has agreed provisionally to a, Pakistan, to a, to a uh, ceasefire, if you would agree. And as the head of state of Sudan hesitated, President Carter said to the head of state of, of Sudan, General al-Bashir, well, I'm gonna have a press conference tonight. CNN is here with me. I'll either announce that the Southerners had agreed to a ceasefire and uh, you guys in uh, Khartoum would not agree, or we can go on television together and announce that there's a ceasefire. And so we got the, we got the ceasefire, <laughs> meanwhile, <laughs> Meanwhile, be careful what Politics. you wish for, because the condition of the ceasefire was that, this was an announcement about uh, 10.30 p.m. or so, Khartoum time. The condition of the ceasefire was that the ceasefire would begin the next midnight, uh, uh, midnight about a little bit more than 24 hours uh, later. And that ceasefire lasted almost six months, initially for two months, extended for two months, and then we won't start fighting it, the other side doesn't start. So it lasted almost six months, and as Bill Fagey indicated in, in the video, it was not just guinea worm, it was first treatments in Sudan, mass treatments for river blindness, immunizations oh, yeah. for polio, for measles, ORS, uh, oral rehydration uh, solution for children with diarrhea, lots of other things uh, started in addition to the guinea worm eradication program in Sudan. Well, as a journalist, I can certainly appreciate that it was all done during the duress of a press conference. So uh, I think uh, that's, uh, if peace can come by threat of press conference, mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, that's remarkable. You, you know, one thing since the Car Carters have retired from public life is, and I, I don't want to say that this might be a positive aspect of it, but at, at least you don't have to worry about being late to any of the meetings with President Carter, right? Yeah. Because, uh, <laughs> President Carter is uh, famously frugal and famously punctual, right, Sarah? Yes, absolutely. Yep. And so, so what would happen if you were late or if you weren't somewhere on time, if you had to be there? And oh, yeah, well, even on Carter family trips, you know, if you, were, if you were the last one to the bus, then you were late, even if you were before the scheduled time. <laughs> so, you know, and, and you would get, you know, you would get a little scolding and, you know, a little ribbing, and it would be, you know. So that was, uh, yes, he was always extremely punctual. And if you're doing an interview with President Carter, if I ever saw him do this with his watch, you know, I thought, oh, I, I, I need to wrap this up or he's done, you know. Uh, so this was the kiss of death for you. You didn't want to have him look at your watch and know that uh, he, was, uh, he, he was ready to be, be done with it. Um, uh, but, but Frank, I mean, having him in the field with you, um, or at least having him come, uh, clearly, I mean, he's not in the field all the time while you're doing this work, but when he would come into the field to, to do a visit and you'd take him around and, and, and show him some things, Maybe explain the reaction people would get. Did many people know when he was coming he's a former president of the United States and he's here to give them bed nets or here to give them uh, antibiotics? I never had the experience of people not knowing who President Carter right. was when we went somewhere. <laughs> right. Uh, and I also, just to mention, had the experience of in China when I, when I went with a delegation with President Carter and I had to check my bag because it was just like two inches over the roll-ons. They left me in the air, President Carter left me in the airport <laughs> and went and said, and said, well, Frank, you have to find your way to the hotel because we're leaving. <laughs> Very embarrassing. I was, I was told later by the, the past uh, CEO of uh, the Carter Center, Dr. John Hardman, that happened to me once and I discovered I should only pack blue so I don't have to bring too much. So. <laughs> 
But uh, you know, the, the the I think Sarah, you're you're pointing out the look you could get from President Which Carter. Yes. Uh, he had very look. expressive looks and and penetrating looks uh, that could make you uh, very uncomfortable. Um, but in some cases, in some very good ways. And and I remember we were in a clinic seeing patients with um, lymphatic filariasis, um, lymphedema, and elephantiasis. And there was there was one woman. Um, young woman, 19 years of age, uh, and I went in with President Carter and we, we saw her leg. It wasn't a serious elephantiasis, but it was deforming lymphedema with scars up and down her leg from traditional medicine trying to um, release the fluid. And she said, I tried these medicines you're giving. I know you're giving, but they don't work. <clears throat> and President Carter, can't you fix this leg? And uh, he looked at me and he said, can't we fix this leg? <laughs> and I, I said, you know, we're, this is preventive medicine. She can do, we can do wrapping and elevation and, and prevent infection, but I'm afraid we're not going to be able to get this leg back to normal. And he, he, the expression in his eyes were of great disappointment that he, having been the most powerful person on the planet, could not help this young woman who appealed to him to fix her leg. And uh, I think we all recognize that. You know, there, there's only some, so much we can do, and sometimes we can't alleviate the suffering that we would wish. And it, it just makes me think that our work will go on long after we're here um, to continue on the, um, the mission to alleviate suffering. I, I would note also, uh, speaking of, of the look, in uh, 19, uh, when was it, uh, 2007, when we went up to uh, northern Ghana, arrived at this place where there was just at the, uh, the district hospital, there were literally scores of people with guinea worm disease. They'd had an explosion of guinea worm uh, in that place the last couple of months, and we were all very angry, but uh, President Carter was angrier than, than, than most because this is 2007 and there were many fewer cases of guinea worm uh, disease. And when he came back to uh, Accra, the capital, to give a press conference that afternoon with the uh, representative of the Ministry of, of, of Health, he just re reflected on what he had seen up in northern Ghana. And when he, at the press conference and later when he met again with the head of state, he threatened to rename the parasite Ghana worm <laughs> if Ghana <laughs> didn't uh, get their uh, act, uh, act together. And that was not the only occasion when he used the, uh, the threat of renaming guinea worm after whatever country was, was, was lagging. And uh, another example of uh, his uh, persistence and, and um, call it gentle aggressiveness. Yes. <laughs> yeah. um, I... Julie, you, you have a story about uh, meeting President Carter in the field as well. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I had been traveling to, I was traveling to Nigeria. It was my, I think my first trip to Nigeria and everything had gone wrong with the trip. You know, like uh, I hadn't been, there was a problem with the pickup and finding the place, and, and, and it was really just had been so long a journey, you know, and you know that feeling, you, you guys know this feeling. You get to a place and you're so tired, and you're like, you don't know where you are, you're just like, I just need something to eat and a flat bed. And I I'm go down to the, the, lo the, the, it's an outdoor lobby space, and there's a, a, what appears to be a restaurant, and I open the door, and it's all dark inside. And I step in the door and then I hear, Julie, come join us. And I'm like, look over and it's President Carter. <laughs> and I'm like, seriously? I, I really think I'm dreaming. How did, I, how did this happen? Um, but uh, he invited me over to the table and I shared this, the, one of the most amazing meals of my life. I have no idea what I ate. I heard uh, such fantastic, amazing stories. And it was just that piece that he had of like, you know, making people feel welcome and equal at that table. And here I was with just some of the most amazing people on the planet. And I was completely, completely welcome, you know? And it was a, it was a really special, special meal. 
You know, President Carter is perhaps the most accessible president in the history of our country. Um, perhaps hundreds of thousands of people have met him through the course of a book signing, you know, uh, waiting in line and getting their book signed. That uh, he, I mean, he's authored over 34 books, and so many of them he went on national book tours, and so people have the opportunity to come through and do the book signings. Um, <clears throat> Uh, literally thousands have probably sat in the audience at his church in Plains, Georgia and watched him teach Sunday school and then afterwards got their picture posed with him sitting Amazing. in a chair there at the church. Um, but then perhaps tens of thousands more around the world have had the access to him by standing in line to have him give them um, ivermectin doses or to um, shake his hand or, or, or even passing out the filters that are sitting on your seat. Those were also given to people in the parts of the world that, that need to have those filters. President Carter would pass those out. And I, I, re I remember too, I, I've used the video in some of my reports, President Carter passing out bed nets um, uh, to people um, in, in rural communities where, where that's needed. I mean, um, is, is, I think that if, we know what we're getting when we're standing in line to get a book signed, or we know what we're getting when we're you know, sitting in, down to do an interview. Um, what is the reaction like of the people who are receiving life-changing help directly from a former president. And I'll ask you, Dr. Richards, because I think um, some of the video shows you with him there as he's doing some of this. Well, Pre President Carter has always been passionate about the poor, um, and especially the, the very poor. But he's also made the point about human dignity, and that He'll, he'll say on many occasions, these people are as smart as me, they make logical decisions. Um, we're here to help do what we can to empower them, but they're perfectly, these countries are perfectly capable um, with a little help to take on their problems and their challenges. And that, that ought to be our objective as partners. So when, when he's in, they're handing out bed nets or medicines, you, you really have a, a feeling from him of, um, uh, I would almost say reverence in terms of, of what he's involved in doing as part of a greater mission. And um, I, I don't how to know how to explain it any better than, than respect and human dignity as well as human and social rights. It's great empathy on his part. Yeah. It's empathy, it's compassion, compassion. Um, and, but it's also justice. He feels that, that the world could be a more just place and health, is, and health is a very big part of that. I think he really believed that global health is a link to global peace. And he said so much in, when he took his uh, Nobel Prize in 2002. We need to work with this great divide between the rich and the poor. I would also mention that you know there's there's something about sort of a, a uh, well the example of a former president of the United States coming to a country, going yes. to a rural area, and working with people in the villages. Sometimes, often, usually, when the head of state is you know, back, back in the, 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 one of the former heads of state of Ghana wrote afterwards about uh, when uh, President Carter would come repeatedly to the con country, importuning uh, him as head of state of Ghana to do something about Guinea Worm, about how he felt president of Ghana, <clears throat> ashamed that was not his word, but mortified was not his word either. But that uh, he felt something unpleasant that uh, the former head of state of the United States was coming, going out visiting villages, empathizing with people in those rural communities. Yes, he is president of Ghana, knew what Guinea Warmer what, what was, had seen people with it, but there was President Carter out there working with people in the villages and uh, implicitly urging him, head of state of Ghana, to help do more about it as well. And, and one other thing on that, it's, the other part is about him showing up, right? He shows up, and even in the mundane, so like, you know, when you're at a, a Carter Center Review, Guinea Worm in particular, you know, like, he'll show up. 
Hmm. And he sits there in this meeting, a meeting, you know, like it's not, it's not just photo ops. Which he's punctual for. Right, right, yeah, exactly. And he'll sit there in the meeting and you're like, wow, how long is he gonna stay, you know? And he stays for the whole thing. And not only that, after each presentation, he, has he asks really good questions. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're, I'm like, my gosh, he is following all, of, it's just amazing, you know, these meetings that you're like, oh my gosh, do I have time to be here? And you're like, oh my gosh, I guess I really should have time to be here. <laughs> <laughs> The point there is that his presence is meaningful. It's not just Absolutely. a token presence to say that, 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 that he's there showing up. Um, Dr. Ajaz, we actually have a special video. I kind of just want to maybe have you set it up for us here. Um, yeah, <clears throat> I mean, I was just, you were mentioning about the bed nets. Um, speaking of bed nets, I mean, um, Carter Center doesn't do a lot of malaria work, but we still do some of it uh, in the island of Hispaniola. But one thing, um, when I actually met um, uh, Dr. Tedros, I've met him many times, but when I met him in my capacity as the Vice President for the Carter Center Health Program, um, he vividly remembered that when he was the Health Minister for Ethiopia, and when Carter Center wanted to start the work on river blindness and lymphatic filariasis in Ethiopia, he said that unlike a lot of other NGOs, you know, Carter Center basically listened to what the country's needs were. And, and um, he said that um, when Carter Center uh, representatives, and I think, Don, you were there, um, came to um, say, well, we want to start the river blind, he said, he said, that's all great, but my problem is malaria. What can you do about malaria? So uh, I know that, uh, as Don told me, they were perplexed, and they said, okay, let us think about it. And then they went back and talked to President Carter, and President Carter said, Yes, that's what the country needs. And then we will actually definitely give them bed nets. And, and because of that, you know, the malaria uh, prevalence has gone way down in Ethiopia today. Um, so I, I saw um, DG Tedros uh, at the UN General Assembly recently, and he still, he first asked me about this session as he was going to make some remarks, which you will hear in a minute. But he also again narrated the very same story that's sort of ingrained in his mind as to how the Carter Center listened and President Carter reacted to their needs. So let's take a look at the video. Dear colleagues and friends, we gather to celebrate the legacy of President Jimmy Carter and Miss Rosalind Carter, who personify the spirit of humanitarian collaboration through the Carter Center. The Carter Center has worked tirelessly to eradicate debilitating diseases that have afflicted communities for many years. In 1986, the Carter Center began working with WHO on the Guinea Worm Eradication Initiative. Since then, cases have declined from an estimated 3.5 million in 20 countries to just six cases reported from two countries so far this year. This incredible achievement is testament to what we can do when big dreams meet hard work. It can change the world. President and Miss Carter didn't stop there. They have also fought onchocerciasis, lymphatic filariasis, schistosomiasis, and trachoma, extending support in some of the worst affected countries. Many have now eliminated this debilitating disease or are on their way towards elimination. I also commend Ms. Carter's contribution to destigmatizing mental health conditions in favor of a holistic and person-centered approach. The Carter Center is now working with WHO on a three-year plan on neglected tropical diseases, mental health, malaria, antimicrobial resistance, and data and analytics. We are committed to upholding the Carter's legacy of hope and compassion for a healthier, safer, fairer world. I thank you. Um, author Jonathan Alter recently wrote a book about President Carter called uh, His Very Best. And uh, Jonathan's a friend of mine. And uh, about three months ago, we were having a conversation and about President Carter, and we, as we often do, we talk about his life and his legacy, and what's remarkable to me is that, and he explores this a bit in the book, but President Carter is the only president in U.S. history, or perhaps the only president of any state, who 
who, who really bridges three centuries. He was born in Plains, Georgia in the Great Depression in which he was born into a house where there was no running water or electricity. And as a child, he used to plow the fields with a mule. And uh, he's the first ac president actually born in a hospital. Um, he would go on to become one of the first uh, in the nuclear Navy uh, when he was in the Navy and uh, was um, not necessarily, he, he was a nuclear specialist um, in the first nuclear submarine in the US Navy. He would go on to become the US president during the Cold War uh, and faced his own nuclear crisis at Three Mile Island. And he would go on from there to become the founder of the Carter Center with Mrs. Carter, in which they would then champion creating a healthier world for the 21st century. Born in the 19th century, lived in the 20th, provides a future for the 21st. Sarah, um, much of your family inherit not just the legacy, but even um, some of the qualities, and you can see that in the careers that many of you have pursued. Um, I was joking earlier, I said, you know, Jason's gone on to be the politician, but, uh, which is your brother, but, but, but everybody else is kind of pursuing um, science and engineering uh, disciplines. Maybe talk to us a little bit about that legacy. Yeah, well, it's, um, yeah, well, I am a, the scientist. My PhD is in uh, neuroscience and molecular biology, so not, not public health, but adjacent a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think I always thought of my grandfather and my grandmother too, for that matter, as being very analytical, very scientific, very, you know, Julius describing how he, he asks questions. And it's true, like whenever I was working on something or when I was working on my PhD, he would want to know and he would ask all the questions and he would, you know, be really interested in that. And I, I think that one of the things that, that really motivates that and one thing that he can see in his own life is, that, is this idea of progress of making progress, and, and he has said before that he grew up on a farm that was more like the farms of a thousand years ago than the farms of today. And, I, and you can see that, you know, and he was always, he always wanted to know what's next, you know, where are we going, how are we gonna make things better? And it was, um, and it takes a lot of work, and, and it, you know, Frank mentioned that he was so disappointed that he couldn't help that yeah. woman, that we couldn't do anything for her, because all, all the treatments were just preventative. And it's, you know, like he, he wants to get there. He wants, to, he <laughs> you know, wants he, to fix it. He wants to fix it. And the guinea worm stuff, you know, he is just focused on that. And that's part of the, the intensity. You know, Don mentioned the, the kind of just, you know, the intensity about it and just the focus that he has. And that's something that's, you know, he's a unique person, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, but it's all, um, but it's all very, it, it's all directed into the future, trying to make progress, make things better, get it done. Yeah, Frank. Just, just to follow up on that um, and his analysis, he would always tell the staff, use me. How can I help? I've got the access, but if you want to use me, I have to understand. And, and what, so he would get into the details, but then when you would give him the ask, you know, what's the ask, he would often say, that's not enough. <laughs> I'm not gonna be here forever. Why don't we ask? for what we need. And so, well, President Carter, we might ask for too much. We might, it's, we shouldn't be afraid of failure to ask what we need if the goal is worthwhile. And, and that was sort of uh, an MO. And I was in meetings when he would go beyond the briefing notes <laughs> where we would say, here's your ask, and he would ask for more, and then he wouldn't get it, but then <laughs> he would adroitly very well moved back to the original ask as the fallback position. And uh, it was very interesting to, to watch his, his wonderful political acumen. So we, we are just down to our last couple of minutes here. So go ahead, Dr. Just another quick example from a different uh, direction. The uh, head of state of one of the endemic countries came to the Carter Center with an entourage and uh, in public, President Carter, they held a, uh, it was an election year in that country, they held a uh, press conference at the Carter Center, the head of state did, and talked about various things. President Carter was very complimentary of this, this head of state and the things that were being done there. But in private, uh, this country was falling behind in Guinea Worm. And, and in private, I was not in the meeting because I didn't speak French. But uh, a friend of mine was, or a colleague from the Carter Center, he said that in private, President Carter read that same head of state privately, the Riot Act. 
about uh, <laughs> not uh, that this country was falling so far behind, but just, just another yeah. example of uh, how he used the politics publicly and privately. Um, I would not want to be on the receiving end of that. Uh, no, you wouldn't. Of, of that, of that riot. Uh, before we go into a video, um, Dr. Jaws, um, the last interview that I did with President Carter in 2019, um, he expressed to me the same expression that he shared with the world in 2015 when it was announced that he was battling cancer, that um, he wants to see the last skinny worm die before he does. Um, and that clock is kind of ticking. It is. And it is, do you feel the pressure of trying to meet that expectation? Absolutely not, of course not. <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, I mean, this is, this is, um, this is something that, we, like I said a minute ago, I mean, we are going to see the end of Guinea worm. Um, we are, the last mile is the, the toughest to run uh, because there are fewer cases, you have to do a lot more surveillance and you have to act. But at the same point in time, we are actually doing a lot more work on the operational research side to basically find new tools uh, other than the tools that you have on your chairs uh, or, or the treatment of water. But we are also looking at some of the other tools in order to do a better job and see if we can um, prevent infections even in the, the dogs as well. So that's what we're working on. But um, I know uh, my colleagues who work in the, in the health programs, they're all very laser focused on our existing commitments. And this is one of our biggest existing commitments. Well, on that note, I just wanted to thank uh, Julian Kasha for inviting us all to come here to be able to um, honor President and Mrs. Carter and talk about the very thing that they would want us to, uh, the work that they've championed for so many years. Um, and I'll turn it back over to you both now. Well, I mean, I, I, I think, you know, I mean, it's uh, carrying a, a great legacy that President and Mrs. Carter has actually set up for all of us. Uh, you know, it's, it's not only the Carter Center, but for all of us who actually work in the field of global health, it's something that we actually have to carry the baton and, and the standards have been set by them. And so in order to carry that baton for disease eradication, elimination, or even control, this is something that we are all committed to doing and, and um, it's like an unwavering commitment, at least on part of us who work at the Carter Center, but I know even in people in public health, that's something that uh, everybody wants to um, focus on. So, so thank you. Yeah. And I think if I can speak on behalf of you, the ASTMH family, we're committed to these, these visions and these pieces, and I think that piece of having a dream and the commitment and doing the hard work and, and showing up and speaking up uh, is, is, and doing the amazing science and the amazing pieces, I, I think that legacy will live on, hopefully, in the work of, of all of the people in this room and, uh, and through the great progress that we will insist upon seeing that uh, great science also needs to be applied. Um, so uh, I hope you all will, will find this inspiring to you as, as my uh, brief interactions uh, have been with President Carter uh, and the great work of the Carter Center. And with that, we're going to be able to show you now uh, a video that will very, very um, viscerally kind of explain and show you the, the uh, nature of the work and the legacy of what the Carter Center is doing. And thank you very much for joining us here today. So, you see, she gets three, yeah, right. three tablets. Three, three, three tablets, see? Yeah. Well, anyone who cares about basic human rights knows that uh, one of the fundamental human rights is a right to good health. We think everybody has a right to have good health and a peaceful life. We work very hard to try to make that happen for people over the world. Alcosacasis, lymphatic polarosis, schistosomiasis, and trachoma. I'd like to quote what President Carter said, that there are no neglected diseases, only neglected people. These are the people at the end of the road. The Carter Center has a unique approach. We are an organization that is bottom up. We focus on the principles of community. We focus on the community health workers. We focus on community support. The end of the day, what we want to do is empower people um, in, the, in the countries where we work to be able to carry on without necessarily having us there all the time. 
When President and Mrs. Carter took up this work, there were 3.5 million cases of guinea worm each year. Now we are down to just 13 human cases on a planet of 8 billion people, and every year the number is dropping. The Carter Center has helped distribute nearly a billion treatments to combat NTDs. We have supported 900,000 surgeries to prevent blindness in people suffering from advanced trachoma. What they have done for global health is just uh, incalculable. I stand in real awe of what they were able to do. Mrs. Carter was, of course, involved in all of these things, so intimately involved. And what she did in mental health was so important. One of the most remarkable aspects of their legacy is the track record of this organization, how healthy it is, how well supported it is, and how ready it is uh, for what's next. President and Mrs. Carter have accomplished things no one else could have. They've inspired us to search out new ideas to forge a healthier future, and they've convinced global leaders to do more to fight diseases that had long been ignored. Every surgery that we assist, every latrine that we help build, every pink pill of Zithromax that we give out improves a person's life. Because you make such a difference in the lives of people you serve, your work is helping to make history. We will eradicate guinea worm. We will eliminate trachoma. We will control other diseases. That is what our commitment is to continue the legacy of President Mrs. Carter. So as we see from the video, I mean, um, the goals have been set for all of us to continue to strive for in global health. <coughs> and um, so, so thank you. On behalf of the Carter Center, I want to thank uh, Julie. I also want to thank uh, Karen, uh, Dan, um, in terms of um, arranging this um, great event to honor President and Mrs. Carter uh, for um, waging peace fighting disease and building hope. So thank you very much.